Hello and welcome to a very, a very interesting seminar today by uh, Professor Erdinç Tatar, um, who will be talking to us about finding solutions to the MAMS gyroscope drift problem. Uh, Erdinç Tatar received the bachelor's and master's degrees with high honors uh, from our department, uh, electrical and electronics engineering uh, of uh, department of METU and the PhD degree uh, in ECE from Carnegie Mellon. Um, he was uh, a graduate research assistant with the Microelectromechanical Systems Research and Application Center of METU and with Carnegie Mellon. Um, and um, from uh, 2016 to 19, he worked as a MAMS design engineer responsible for the development of next generation gyroscopes in analog devices uh, in Wilmington, Massachusetts. Currently, he's an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, Engineering and UNAM in Bilkent University. His research interests include MAMS sensors, especially inertial and gas sensors, microfabrication and packaging technologies, and readout on control electronics for MAMS sensors. So with that, uh, I will leave the floor to Professor Tatar. Well, thank you very much, Ajahn. So it's a great honor to be uh, with the department again, so where I graduated. Uh, so today I will talk about drift in sensors. So more specifically, my expertise has been in the MAMS gyroscopes. So drift is a major problem for all type of sensors. Uh, so you can visualize drift as, so without the stimulus being applied to your sensor, so whatever you are measuring, uh, your sensor output changes, and then this is called drift. So I see an example on the right here. Uh, so this is, um, I mean, you can visualize this anything. So in the case, this is a MAMS gyroscope and a MAMS gyroscope measures rotation, by the way. So you are not rotating the sensor, but the output, output is drifting. So in your system, something is looking into your in, into this sensor to uh, to measure rotation. Even though there is no physical rotation, the system thinks that uh, the uh, that there is a rotation and errors accumulate in the system. So this can be a, a gyroscope. This can be a temperature sensor. Actually, this can be any type of sensor. So this is a very common problem and people are, have been trying to solve this for years. So the first thing they look at is the temperature because all, temp, all type of sensors have some sort of temperature response. And they did it for uh, this field as well, for a MAMS gyroscope as well. So they looked at how the uh, output changes with respect to temperature. So this provided some improvements but did not solve all the problems. So there are even uh, gyroscopes or other sensors that you can buy. For example, you can buy an ovenized crystal, so which means the temperature is fixed by, an, uh, by a small oven uh, in, in the micro scale, but there is still a drift in the output. So here you see an example. So I'm actually showing uh, my results. So the uncompensated output is this red curve. So I'm not rotating the sensor, but it's generating an output. And the temperature is fixed on the left scale here. I don't know if you can point your options. So on the left here, I show the temperature. The temperature is fixed within uh, plus minus 20 millikelvin, but the output is still drifting. So what we are focusing here is, so if we add stress measurements in addition to temperature to our system, so can we do better compensation? So that is the main motivation of our study. But before I move into uh, more details, first I would like to show you how a gyroscope works. A gyro works, uh, gyro is the short for the gyroscope, based on a force called Coriolis force. So you probably have seen a pendulum, so where you get a big ball and it starts uh, going back and forth. So for example, so if I have a pendulum, and then the pendulum is swinging back and forth. So you can do this experiment in wherever you are living. So you will see that as time passes, the pendulum is gonna still go back and forth, but it's gonna change its trajectory. So this is due to the force, uh, this is due to Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force is related with the rotation. 
so which is cross product with uh, which which you may you have to do a cross product with the velocity so you can visualize this as if there is a uh, orthogonal force to the velocity which is moving the ball towards left so and this is due to the earth's rotation actually the pendulum one of hollow the earth's rotation for example and this is related with the latitude of wherever you live for example if you do this experiment in the poles you will see uh, the maximum response but if you do it on the equator then you, you are not going to see any response because of the cross product so if we do it in ankara which has a latitude of roughly 40 degrees then we are going to see that so you can think of earth rotates uh, one revolution per day which is 360 degrees per uh, day and then if you look at it in an hour basis so it rotates basically 10 hours per 10 degrees per hour so it's extremely slow actually but this is a measurable uh, thing. And if we do this experiment in here, so one full rotation of that pendulum is gonna take around 37 hours. So if you wait 37 hours, so it will come back to the original position. The science museums have this actually. So they put sticks on the sides and then as the pendulum goes back and forth, it's gonna hit to the sticks and the sticks will be, uh, will be collapsed. And then you'll see, you're gonna see as time passes on this periphery of the circle, more sticks will be uh, hit. So how do we do it in the micro domain? So our main goal is uh, miniaturizing this sensor. Uh, so we know that the rotation and the velocity has to be orthogonal since we cannot hang a ball in a small chip. So what we do is we use uh, resonating systems. So we have a mass and then we drive that mass into resonance. So the mass is going back and forth. And then once we have a rotation, in this case, out of plane, uh, looking in, uh, if we rotate the mass, then there is going to be a force in the orthogonal direction. And the mass, instead of going back and forth, so it will have a, a Y displacement as well. So by measuring the displacement in the Y direction, so by, I mean, this has to be done in a special way, of course, then I can extract the uh, rotation. And uh, of course, so we have to measure some sort of characterize how good our sensor is. So for this, we use a test called Allen deviation. So this test is actually simple. So you sit your device, your device sits on a table, you don't rotate it and you collect its output. So normally for an ideal system, so what you should see at the output is pure noise. In this case, pure white noise. And the white noise can be suppressed by averaging. So if you average more and more, it, it goes with square root of time actually. So you should get better resolution. So the y-axis here is the uh, standard deviation of uh, standard deviation and x-axis is my averaging time. So if I average more and more, initially my noise goes down, but at one point you will hit the fundamental noise of the system, which is the flicker noise. So this is due to, uh, most likely due to your circuits. Your circuits in DC do not perform that well. And as you increase your averaging time more and more, so you move more into the DC domain. But as you, as you average even more, then we go into this long-term drift problem. So this is most likely due to your sensor. So our systems, consists of a mechanical element, which is your sensing element, and uh, an electronic circuit that senses the situation of uh, the status of your system. And as you average more, then your system, your sensor starts drifting, and that is what we are trying to suppress. This long-term drift, if we can suppress this down, then uh, we, uh, we, we, we do a good job. So you may ask, what is the state of the art in this case? So uh, the state of the art is something called hemispherical resonating gyroscope, so HRG for short. So this is manufactured by Northrop Grumman, a defense company in US. So this basically is a wine glass. So this is no different than a wine glass, but it has an exceptional performance. So it is, I mean, so you can think of this earth rotates uh, 15 degrees per hour. So every hour, the Earth rotates by 15 degrees. And you can see its uh, performance metrics here. So it goes 10 to the minus 5 degree per hour. So it is very precise. 
The problem is, so they use it, they use this sensor on the satellites that they sent to space because how do you navigate in space? There is no navigation, GPS in other words. So they use these sensors for navigation. The problem is it is not that small and not that big either. So it is like five, five centimeters on it, each edge and it costs $100,000 per exit. So it is extremely expensive. But the current MEMS gyroscopes is what I will talk about. It cannot do anything like close to this one. So this is large relatively uh, with respect to MEMS sensors, but it is very good. So there has been an effort trying to manufacture this in micro scale. So, I mean, this has started around 10 years ago. Some of them has been successful. Most of them are gone, actually. So the surviving ones are the University of Michigan's bird bath resonator. So this looks like a wine glass, but upside down. And uh, so UC Irvine has been working on it. I think they gave up. So they have a company for the one on the left, but it is still not at a product level. So if you move into 3D domain, things get really complex. So while we work in the 2D domain in general, so where do we use these sensors? So actually they are used more frequently than you would think. So the application area, so all of your cellular phones, so they are not very high performance, but your cellular phones, most likely the modern ones in these days have two gyroscopes. So one of them is in the phone itself so that it knows its orientation. You can play games or it can predict if you are falling. The other one is optical image stabilization. So the, cell, the, the, the main camera on your phone, so when you are trying to take a picture, you don't notice it, but, but your hand shakes. And that shake can be seen as a, a rotation of the phone. And if you watch an image or video actually, which is not image stabilized, then you will feel motion sickness because the frame is gonna move constantly. So the gyro in this case measures that rotation and it constantly fixes the field of view. So they don't show you the entire field of view, but they show it like 90% of it. And that 10% is used to change the field of view based on the sensor input. So your cars, for example, electronic stability control. So when you rotate the steering wheel, so they know how much you rotate, let's say 10 degrees, but at the same time with a, a gyroscope, which measures rotation, so they measure the rotation of the car itself as well. So if the steering angle and the car's real physical rotation angle don't match, that means either you are sliding or weird things are happen happening, which is not supposed to happen. So in that case, they apply individual brakes to the wheels such that the rotation angle and the rotation of the car matches for your safety. The drones, the same thing. So anything, a robot or a drone, that has to be sits, uh, still stand needs this stabilization mechanisms. And this is done with gyroscopes, which measure rotation and accelerometers actually, uh, which measure the linear acceleration. So if I combine the three axis gyro and a three axis uh, accelerometer, then you have six degree of freedom, but then you can track yourself and you make an inertial measurement unit. And this is used in autonomous cars at the as the last line of defense if your GPS fails, for example. So we, I will talk about capacitive sensing and this is a fundamental uh, slide that shows how capacitive sensing works. Uh, so a capacitive sensor, you can think of it as a, as a it's, it's basically a capacitor, but it's not the usual capacitors that you use to use in the labs, they are fixed. This one, the ones that we use are movable capacitors. So if you apply a DC voltage to one side of the capacitor, and then if this capacitor goes back and forth, the capacitance changes, Q equals charge times the voltage, the voltage is fixed. So, and then you put a charge amplifier in front of that capacitor on the fixed side. So the charge is fixed, uh, I'm sorry, the voltage is fixed, capacitance is changing. So that gives you a charge, which is basically current. And then you convert that current into voltage. And then you can sense how much displacement you have. So you can use it in the other way as well. So I said, we have to derive our system into resonance. So if you apply an AC voltage to a capacitor, it wants to maximize its capacitance. For that reason, it starts moving. And then, so by applying an AC voltage, in this case, you combine DC and AC to have further amplification. 
you can exert a force in your device, uh, which is uh, used for, uh, then you can use it to move your device. So this, so this is my uh, past work during my PhD. So this is the gyroscope that I used to work with. So this work, uh, this oscillates in two axes. So what you see here in the cartoon is this mass is going back and forth. And because of the alignment of the springs, uh, the other two don't move. And when there is a rotation, this axis starts moving and you measure the displacement on this axis. And that is gonna be a measure of your rotation. So this device was five millimeter by five millimeter in total. So I had the gyro on the center and the stress sensors on the side. So these were piezoresistive stress sensors, which I will talk about. So, so this is what I will show you is the integration of multiple sensors actually on the same chip which makes it challenging. So you have the main element and then the stress sensors to capture the stress so that I can look if I can find the correlation. So the gyroscope is considered to be one of the most complicated uh, MAMS devices. MAMS stands for Microelectromechanical Systems, by the way. So you need to have, in general, four or five control loops. So when, the, when you drive your system into resonance. So you need one loop to keep it into, in, in resonance. So that is the phase lock loop, PLL. And then while it's going back and forth, I have to stabilize the velocity as well, such that my sensitivity is constant. And on, so this is what we call as the drive mode. So we drive one of the axes into resonance and listen to the other mode in the most uh, general case. And on the sense mode, uh, I, I should also remind you that so whatever is coming out of the gyroscope, it's at the drive resonance frequency. So the signal that I'm getting is AC. So I have to convert it uh, to AC such that I can take my measurement. And you need, in general, two loops on the sense mode. So there are other signals that is coming out of the sense, which is not the rotation information. And these, uh, the quadrature loop is used to cancel that. So you need multiple loops. So this requires complicated electronics. So let me briefly talk about the uh, stress sensing. So how do we sense stress? So the cheapest way, the easiest way is, so you might have heard of metal foils, foil gauges. So if you pull something, a metal, for example, its geometry changes and that results in a uh, resistance change. In the case of silicon, because it's a semiconductor, so it exhibits piezoresistive properties. By piezoresistive properties, I mean since silicon is a single crystal, so once you apply a stress, the position of the atoms in the crystal with respect to each other changes, and that results in a resistance change. And th this is much more uh, strong, uh, much stronger than the uh, geometric changes. So what I do is basically I have like fixed fixed uh, beams. So it's a, this is a long beam fixed from two ends. And if you pull it, its resistance is gonna change. But there is one problem here. This also changes with temperature because uh, temperature coefficient of resistance for silicon also exists. So I don't wanna capture the temperature effects. I'm interested in stress. So I have to cancel the temperature. For that reason, you use the same structure, but this case, uh, so it is fixed only from one side. And once you apply stress, it doesn't change. So here you see the test results when you apply a temperature. So both resistors. So the one with changes stress and temperature, I call R stress. The other one that changes only with temperature, I call R no stress. So once you apply a temperature, both of them change. So once you apply a stress, this is this right image here, only the stress sensitive one changes. And if you combine everything in a Wheatstone bridge, then the temperature effects are highly suppressed. So we know what a gyro is more or less. So we know what the stress sensors are. So this is the stress setup actually. So I ionize the device. So I have a heater here, temperature controller uh, and a heater inside the device. I mean, the heater is outside but the temperature sensing is on the device. And then, so I fix the temperature of the device and I, I have this copper weight on top of the device. So this aluminum block is used for heating the device and this copper is to induce stress. Then what I do is once the temperature has settled, I quickly move this 
uh, copper weight from right to left and left to right, and then to see what's going on. So the temperature is fixed here. I'm only changing the stress. So this is the test result. So this is the gyroscope output. The blue one is the uncompensated one. So the, I'm sorry, the red one. So this red one, basically you can see from the square wave behavior that when I move the copper weight from left to right and right to left. And then if I, I have multiple sensors, so if I have multiple stress sensors. So if you look into this blue curve S3 here, you can see a good correlation in between the gyro and the stress. And then once I use this data to compensate the changes, then I get this more uh, stable blue output. So this is a demonstration of how stress compensation, uh, stress affects the sensor output, and I can use stress to compensate, to fix the sensor output. So you might say that no one jumps on top of their sensors. In this case, what I'm doing is I, the copper weight is removed, sensor is sitting there, the gyro out, the blue one is the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the red one is the uncompensated one. And here again, if you look into stress, although I'm not applying anything externally, so there is something going on, it might be aging or something that we are not aware of, changing the stress. And I, when I use this uh, stress sensor output to fix my uh, gyro output, then I get this very straight curve. So this is the time axis in the uh, units of minutes here. So this is around 12 hours. So if I use my stress sensor output, then I can fix my gyro output. And you can see that the temperature here, uh, the blue curve is fixed within uh, plus minus 10 millicalorie. And then if I use my Allen deviation test, the, uh, the, the, the performance metric that I showed, then, so this solid curve is uh, when there is no uh, compensation. And this dashed curve is when I use stress compensation. As, as you can see, even uh, around three hours, so I can still get like uh, white noise response. So this was all good, but there were some problems. So the consistency of the uh, stress to gyro output relation, so the, your, your compensation coefficients was not right. So then time has passed. So I worked and then I, uh, I, I arrived, arrived at Bilkent. So today what I'm doing is uh, instead of having like a rectangular gyroscope, I would say, because the stresses all have to do with your anchors. So since the structure has to go back and forth, you have to attach your structure to the substrate uh, with anchors. So the anchors are the key. And whenever there is a stress, you can think of stress as slow movement of your substrate or your anchors, then uh, problems start happening. So if you do a rectangular gyroscope, then your anchors are, uh, anchors are all over your device. There is no choice. And then the only location you can have your stress sensors is on the sides. But if you do a circular one, the circular ones are in general, there is a huge empty space at the center and your electrodes are on the sides then I can combine my uh, stress sensors and the gyroscopes or, or they can be merged in a better way. And I don't, so I show piezoresistive stress sensors here, but I don't have to use piezoresistors. I will show you, uh, I, I'm using capacitive strain, strain gauges right now. So this is how this structure moves. So this is different than the rectangular one that I showed you. So this is moves in this, this, these are called wine glass modes. So this is called the two theta mode. The reason is if you, so this is like a radial displacement. If you plot radial displacement with respect to angle, so you are gonna uh, see that this is either cosine two theta or sine two theta. And as you can see, there is a lot of empty space here. So I can put my stress sensors on the inside and outside and uh, run my experiments. So the modeling, so this may be a little confusing here. So the modeling here is done based on, if you look into this image, so the modeling is done based on, you use cylindrical coordinates, and then you look into radial displacement and the tangential displacement. So if I pick any point here, with respect to center, it has a radial displacement and tangential displacement. So the radial displacement is on the second line here. So it follows 
cosine and theta. So n can be two, three, so based on uh, whatever you pick. And there's a tangential displacement and that is sine and theta divided by n. This comes from the fact that the ring is not extendable. So while it's moving, it's the, 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 uh, the circumference of the center line remains constant. So you see other modes here. So this uh, is this uh, n equals two mode is what we are using. And most of the people use this because it has better properties with respect to the other modes. You can do n equals three. In this case, this looks like a rectangle or n equals four, which looks like, I mean, roughly like a square. And so the resonance frequency is given here. It, it is a function of its width and its radius. So how do we uh, implement this idea? So this is uh, uh, the, the schematic of what we are doing here. So you need to have electrodes around the device so that you can drive and sense the displacement. So I'm not showing the inside electrodes. So there are, there are also electrodes. I'm only showing one of them. So this is a ring. And then within the ring, so we have eight stress sensors and out of the ring, we have eight stress sensors more. In general, we have 16 stress sensors in a gyro uh, compared to the past. So these are merged better. So the stress sensors are evenly distributed inside the gyro. So which we believe, so we will see if uh, we can get, uh, which we believe will lead to better stress correlation. And so this is one type of a, device. So this is a ring, but we can also make disks, which we are doing actually. And let me talk about the new stress sensor. So if you use piezo resistance, the resistance of silicon, it is nice. The problem is it consumes power. So there is, it's a resistor, you have to apply some sort of voltage, and there is static power consumption, which is not nice. And the piezo resistance of piezo resistance of silicon also depends on the temperature. That is also not nice because you're sensitive to changes with temperature. So this device is a capacitive bridge. So if you push this from sides, as you can see, so these are not balanced. So once you push, so because of this imbalance, there is going to be an amplification. And this is one over tangent alpha. And then uh, you can read your stress. So this is the, the, the way to read this is you apply two clocks. Uh, this is again done in an AC uh, frequency. And you look into one of the capacitances increase, one of them decreases. So you look into the difference and uh, sense the output. So very quickly, so how do we model? So we have done some modeling uh, non-idealities in a ring gyro. In here, we looked at if the width is not uniform, but changes with respect to theta, which is very common. Then what we end up seeing at the end is, so instead of your uh, gyro rotating or vibrating in the main axis, so everything rotates by an angle of phi, and this leads to, to some undesirable angle errors, which may be as large as thousands of degrees per second. We've also done some work modeling the disk, uh, approximating its resonance frequency. So by starting through uh, boundary conditions, we assume uh, the we have the wine glass motion and going inside. So we derive the uh, boundary conditions for the internal rings and by minimizing the total potential energy. So we can analytically model the ring gyro, the, the disc gyroscope, which is in general, not analytically modeled. And this is just to show you that uh, our modeling is shown in blue and the red one is what is simulated and they are very close. So this is the real device. Uh, so this is actually fabricated by Matthew Mams, a uh, microsystem, microsystem lab, which is basically a spin-off from Matthew Mams. So you see the device here. So we have the gyro and the 16 stress sensors. It has to be routed. It becomes a really complex job, actually. And this is the cross-section of this process. So the advantage here is so it is vacuum packaged. So once you receive your device, you can test it easily. And you can see the locations and everything has to be routed properly. So the layout work was uh, very uh, challenging. And then we received the devices a couple of months ago. We are doing some measurements in these days. So this is the probe measurement. So we just look into the gyros. So they are working around 60 kilohertz for one, around 40 kilohertz for the other one. And you need to have like two matched frequencies 
they are pretty close. And this is how a fabricated device looks like. So some words on the stress sensors. As I said, the output of the stress sensor is, is at AC. And normally we used locking amplifier to read this AC signal. But since we have 16 uh, stress sensors plus a gyro, so we can't have 16 different uh, phase lock loops. Or uh, what we can do here is, so we are collecting all the device outputs. We have a multiplexer and then uh, so we are doing hardware demodulation, and by changing these select bits, we are deciding which stress sensor to read. And uh, our overall setup, so we are using a digital locking amplifier to control the gyro. Unfortunately, the locking amplifier is totally occupied by this locking amplifier, and this costs around 25,000 euros, so we can't buy 16 of these. Uh, the stress sensor outputs are going into after uh, demodulated, their DC value has been selected, uh, go into this device and digital select bits to read which stress sensor uh, we are looking at is changed continuously. Since stress is a slowly varying uh, parameter, it is okay, we can use this multiplex scheme. So you see here what we are doing. So this is the gyro. So it's put in a package, you do wire bonding, and then it plugs into a PCB, which includes uh, the analog electronics plus multiplexers. And the digital PLL that we are using is this white box. And we also have a rate table to test the gyro. So we are currently in the process of testing the gyro. So I will show you some stress sensor test results. So what we do here is, so this white is just the cap. So if I push on top of this device, and then I look into my stress sensors. So this is the temperature, upper left one. The other ones are the stress outputs. So this device had eight. So we have more sophisticated ones with 16 stress sensors. As you can see, once we push, something is going on here. The stress sensors are reading. And then we also did some tests where we changed the temperature. So once you change the temperature here, I'm talking about the upper left one is the temperature again. I'm talking about 20 degrees of uh, change. The stress should change because there is a, a temperature coefficient of expansion mismatch with the device and the surroundings. The outputs are changing. So we are in the process of moving to our final stage in this case. So we had some noise issues with the gyro. So they are currently being resolved. Most of them are resolved actually. So what I should have shown you is a gyro and a stress sensor. How do we correlate the outputs? Unfortunately, I don't have it currently. It will probably be available in a matter of uh, weeks or uh, one or two months. So more testing with the gyro is on the way. And that completes my presentation. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. I think I didn't go over time. Thank you so much. Uh, this was perfect timing. Um, we have time for a few questions. I'm sure some of you are working in the electronics area and those others uh, may be working in uh, industries that use such devices. I mean, if you are using an inertial measurement unit and like for anything navigation, then these sensors are inside. No questions, it was very confusing. Of course. Hocam, GPS yerine kullanılıyor demiştiniz ya, nasıl kullanılıyor uzaydı GPS yerine? Ben onu merak ettim. Şimdi burada 